Greetings everyone and welcome to this new video on mask tools for Blender and in this video we'll be discussing the new landscape node which is a new feature in version 1.8. Now whether you're creating these landscapes for game environments or for large scene renders for things like concept art, uh, the landscape node allows you to do this really quickly and gives you a ton of features on how to customize the look of your landscape. So with that said let's jump into Blender and get started. First thing I'll do is delete my default cube and then type shift A and add a plane. Now we need some geometry for the plane so that we can add some displacement. So I'll go to my modifiers tab and choose the subdivision surface modifier. Now I'll increase the viewport level and the render levels all the way up to six. And we can choose a simple subdivide or the Catmull Clark, but we need to tap into edit mode and increase the mean crease, which will sharpen up all of those corners. And finally, I'll just add a few more subdivisions to give this a little more geometry to work with. Okay, so next I'll split my window because we're going to need the shader editor. I'll create a new material, which gives us our principled BSDF. And I'll change the name of the material to landscape and then delete that principled shader. Now I can click on the mask tools tab and open it up to view the options. Now, I could add the landscape node independently if I wanted to build my own setup, but I'm going to choose the landscape preset. This gives me a series of nodes that are already pre-connected and ready for me to start creating my material. Now, the last node in this line is the material shader. So let's go to our rendered view and then connect the material shader to the material output. And after doing so, you'll notice that there is some noise generated on our plane. But in order to actually see the displacement, we need to be in the Cycles Render Engine. I'll also switch from CPU to GPU Compute, and then check this little box next to Denoise. This will make the viewport far more responsive. Now all I need to do is connect the displacement from the material shader to the material output, and we've started to generate our landscape. Now let's go back to the first node in the preset, which is the landscape node. And the first thing that you'll see are these inputs for textures. Similar to the other nodes in Mask Tools, these are the common texture types that you will download from sites like textures.com. And here I'm just switching my timeline to a file browser so that I can access all of the textures that I have planned to use in this project. So I'll start by adding this cliff rock texture. And I can just drag these and drop them right into the shader editor and then connect them to their corresponding inputs. I'm also making sure to change the color space to the roughness and the normal maps to non-color data. Okay, so before going over the settings on the landscape node, I want to improve the lighting in the scene. So to do that, I'll go to the world material and add an environment texture. You can download these for free at HDRI Haven, or you can find some really good tone maps on textures.com. Okay, so that's already looking quite a bit better, but I'm going to increase the strength, make it a little brighter, and now I'll go back to the object material. Okay, so you'll notice that in this example, we're not going to be using a displacement texture, but there are some key things to go over in case you will be using one for your project. Now, in this example, we're using this rocky ground texture. And if we add the displacement texture, you'll notice that nothing actually happens. That is, unless we use the add texture height slider. Now, if we take this all the way up, you'll notice that it's only using the height information from that texture. So in order to get a blend between the two, we just need to decrease this slider until you have the desired effect that you're looking for. Now to preserve the information from that height map and get rid of some of that generated noise, we can just decrease the roughness value. Now we have a nice hilly landscape while still keeping the detail in those rocks. Now we're going to talk about how we can control the texture coordinates for all of that generated noise. If I tab into edit mode and I scale this landscape along the Y axis, you'll notice that the noise texture now has stretched. This is just how generated coordinates work. So if you want to correct this, all you need to do is switch from generated to object, and now you have a nice even noise displacement. And I'll scale the noise down a bit to make this look a little better, 
Uh, but so anytime you're creating a landscape that isn't on a plane with four even sides, you'll likely want to use this feature. Okay, so I'll just type Control Z a few times to get rid of all of those changes. Get us back to the original plane. And let's get rid of some of these distractions in the viewport. First, I can come down to Film and then make the background transparent. And then I'll just turn off the overlays. Okay, that looks better. So next on the node, we have the vector coordinates for the location. The X, Y, and the Z can all be customized. This essentially gives us uh, really an infinite number of possibilities for creating landscapes, especially when you consider that uh, in addition to the location, you can also change the noise scale and also the height, which can be done right here with the displacement amount slider. By taking it down, it makes the ground much more level, and by increasing it, you'll get taller peaks. Next, we can independently control the displacement of the ground. This can be useful for a variety of reasons, say if you wanted to create islands, or if you're creating a game environment where too much displaced geometry on the ground might cause issues with the physics. All right, so despite the fact that I've subdivided this plane multiple times and given it a subdivision surface modifier, a lot of that detail is still coming from the bump detail. So this can be controlled with the bump strength slider. And there's an additional slider for the ground bump strength. If I hold control shift and left click on any node, I can scroll down to the various outputs. This will help us to see the next slider, which is the add height value slider. Now, by default, this is set to a value of 0.5, which is about 50% of the effect, but you can turn it off or slide it all the way up. Essentially, it's just creating darker values in the valleys and brightening up the peaks. And while I'm viewing this texture in the color output, I'm going to scale this texture up to be quite a bit larger because I'm essentially creating a very large landscape in this example. Okay, so I think that will work fine. Uh, and now we can look at some of the mask presets on the landscape node. There are four masks in total that help separate various parts of the landscape. But I'm going to go all the way down to ground mask. And each mask output has a custom slider that can determine their start and end points. So we have one for the ground, we have one for the peaks, and we have one for the edges of those peaks. And I'll also be making another video where I use some of these masks for particle distribution. But finally, we have the grass mask. Now, there are a few things that determine the overall appearance of the grass mask, one being the level of subdivisions that you have in the subdivision surface modifier. Next, the shading is very important. So I'm going to use smooth shading to smooth out all of that detail and then increase the subdivisions back to six. Now let's demonstrate how these masks can be used to create our landscape material. First, I'll just reconnect the material shader to the material output. And if we take a look at the second node in the landscape preset, we can see that it's a mask base node. Now, if I plug the grass mask into the mask input, you can see that we still have these rocky slopes, but I've masked out everything that's facing along the Z normal direction. And it already looks quite interesting. You could imagine this being sort of a snowy landscape. Uh, but there's a new node in Mask Tools that we could potentially use uh, called the Mask Edit node. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the grass mask into the first mask input and the ground mask into the second mask input. Now, by default, that adds those masks together. Uh, but if you use the Add Subtract slider, you'll actually subtract the ground mask from the grass mask. Now, if I use the Amount slider, I can increase that effect. I ultimately won't use this for this demonstration, but I just wanted to give a good example of how you might use the Mask Edit node. And I will, however, be using this mask in the next landscape video for, again, baking particle maps for distribution. But since I've used the grass mask, I'm going to add a forest ground texture that I downloaded from textures.com. Since the video is, is basically just an introduction into the landscape node and the landscape preset, I'm making a very traditional style landscape. So nothing particularly fancy about it, but 
you know, just enough to demonstrate the basics. Okay, so that's looking okay, but we need to scale the texture. So I'm going to add a mapping and texture coordinate node. And now I can scale these textures to be quite a bit larger. Now, of course, I'm just doing this by eye, but by default, it's of course set much too big. So that looks pretty good. All right, next I'd like to mask out the ground or the lowest part of the landscape. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to come to the next mask base node. And I'll just take the ground mask and plug it into that mask input. And for this texture, I'm going to use something that has a lot of debris, things like leaves and pine needles and twigs and things that would be exposed if there were no grass growing. And that should clearly define this as like a path or a trail through this landscape. Okay, and just like before, I will add a mapping node so that I can scale this to be larger. And again, I'm just doing this by eye. I'm sure that there's, for environment artists, there's probably a, a real way of calculating this, uh, you know, depending on how many meters your landscape is. Uh, but again, I'm just doing it for demonstration. So let's look at some ways that we can edit this material. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is add some bump. If I take the bump all the way up to one, you'll see that it raises it, but I want to invert that. Okay, now I've created some depth to the path. Now, taking the bump all the way up will override any of the previous bump information in that area. So I'm going to go with a much lower value just to create a tiny little ridge there along the edge. Okay, now I'm going to try using some color blend. So if I take the color blend slider all the way up, you'll see that it's using a lot of the colors from the textures below it. Uh, but I'm just going to add a very small amount just to blend a little bit of that grass color into the dirt. This can help the transition from one texture to another feel a little more seamless and just blends them a little more nicely. Okay, our landscape is looking pretty good, but there's one last node in the landscape preset that we haven't used, which is the wet map painter node. And for this, I'm going to use the same mask as before. I'm going to use the, uh, the ground mask from the landscape node. So if I plug that right into the mask, you can see that it's replaced the ground with these puddles. Although it still keeps all of that previous texture information. So let's see how we can edit these puddles, not only with the wet map node, but also from the landscape node. So first we have the option of, of lowering the ground displacement. This will flatten out the ground. Or we can refine the ground mask, which this is how you would create maybe an island environment. But for this project, I would just like to add some puddles along the path. And we can do that directly from the wet map painter node. And it's really quite simple. I just want to add some noise to this mask. So if I open up mask tools again, I'll select one of these distortion filters. And this first one is just very nice basic noise. Now, many of the nodes and mask tools have a new input called the distortion filter. If we plug this in, we can see that now we've distorted that mask. But we still need to edit this for these puddles to look a little more natural. So the first way that we can do this is by using the refine option on the distortion filter. There's also a new slider on many of the painting nodes, such as the wet map painter and also the mask base node, which allows you to refine the mask directly from there. But they don't work exactly the same, so you will get a slightly different result. Uh, however, both of which work uh, to just basically flatten out those puddles. And now back to the landscape node, I'm going to lower the ground displacement just to flatten things out a little bit more. Now, the wet map painter node really deserves a tutorial of its own because there's just so many features, so I'll be doing that really soon. Uh, but there are a few more ways that I want to customize this. First, I'll give the water some color with the add color slider, and then I can change the color to better sort of represent the color of the soil. Now, by taking the add color slider all the way up, we've hidden all of the texture below. So I want to pull this back some to reveal some of that texture, which makes the puddles look a little more shallow. 
And remember that there's still ways of editing this directly from the distortion filter node as well. You can scale the puddles, you can distort them, add roughness, refine them more. Uh, so there's lots of ways that you can just continue to customize the look of these puddles. And remember that regardless of what uh, changes or effects you add to this landscape material, it will always remain dynamic on the landscape node. So if I were to change the location coordinates for the X, the Y, or the Z, uh, all of those attributes will always stay true for the material. The puddles will be on the lowest part of the ground, the grass will always be on the Z normal, uh, which means you can potentially save this as a blend file and then continue to reuse it for various landscapes. But I think I'm ready to start baking these textures so that the landscape can be used in Eevee. And I wasn't going to do the baking process. I, I've done Mask Tools baking tutorials before, uh, but there are a few differences in baking textures for landscapes, so they are in fact important to go over. One last thing to do before baking is just make sure that you're happy with your material before you start. Uh, you may want to add some effects like ambient occlusion to your color map, which can be done directly from the material shader. And that's really easy to do. If you just slide the ambient occlusion slider up, then you can affect the strength below it. And it's easier to do while viewing from the color output. I generally always edit the color map from the color output. For instance, I think I want to make these puddles a bit brighter. Okay, so that looks good. And I think now I'm pleased with the color map. And so I'm ready for baking. So let's set up to do that now. We'll split the window and we'll open an image editor so that we can see the images that we bake. Now in the shader editor, I'll just add an image texture. And this is important because you need to tell Blender what to bake all of this information to. So we'll create a new texture and we'll call it landscape color. And then I'll make the size of the texture 4096 by 4096. This is a 4K texture, it's rather large, so this will be up to you. Uh, I'll uncheck alpha because we don't need that and then click OK. Now a lot of people have told me that they have issues with baking in Blender, but there are really only two rules. You need to make sure that your object is selected and that your texture is selected. And once they are, if you scroll down to your bake options, I'm going to leave the bake type set to combined and then click bake. And this will take a moment, so I'll come back when it's finished. Now in this example, we've baked everything, the shadows, the highlights, the glossiness and reflections, which is why we see a little bit of noise here. Uh, you can increase the samples if you wanted to get rid of that. However, this is not the type of color map that I'm going to be using. What I'll do instead is add the color output to a viewer node. Now leaving the bake type set to combined will bake anything that's plugged into the viewer node. Now I'll just make sure that my texture is selected, that the landscape is selected, and then click bake again. And now we have more of an albedo style color map uh, that doesn't have any shadows or highlights, uh, with the exception of a little bit of ambient occlusion that we added. So I'll come up to image, and you just want to make sure that you save this somewhere to a file, because Blender will not keep baked images stored in Blender without saving them. All right, so now I'll go back to viewing the full material, and I'll create a new texture. This time we're going to bake our roughness. So I'll open new texture and then call this landscape roughness. Probably keep all of the other settings just as they are. And then click OK. I can, however, change the color space to non-color. Uh, make sure that the texture is selected, your landscape is selected, switch from combined to roughness, and then click bake. Okay, and that baked nicely. I think we have our puddles, and if we zoom in really closely, we can see the variations between the rock and the grass material. Uh, so you want to save this just like you did the color map. And now let's move on to some of the texture maps that require a little bit of editing. First, we'll do our height map or displacement map. So I'll add a new texture, and I will just create a new one and call it landscape displacement and keep the size the same. I will check this 32-bit float box, which will give us a more detailed height map. Now we can view our displacement by just control shift clicking down to view each of these maps through the viewer node. Once you reach displacement, you'll notice that it looks very washed out. There's lots of really bright values. 
Now, this will not bake really well into a height map because those really white areas will plateau. They'll appear flat. Now, we have options for customizing the displacement. We have the scale and the mid-level, which will actually affect the mesh. Below that are the displacement brightness and contrast. These only affect the height map for baking. So if I take the brightness down to a negative 0.4 and the displacement contrast to a negative 0.9, now we have something that looks much more like a traditional height map where you see that gradual gradient and nothing's terribly washed out. This should bake very nicely to a height map. So now I'll just switch the bake type back to combined. I have my texture selected and my landscape selected. I can just click bake. All right, so I think that looks pretty good. I'm just going to go ahead and save this with my other textures. And now we can do the final texture, which is the normal map. So I'll add a new texture, create a new, call it landscape normal. And these settings are fine. Uh, now the normal map requires a little bit of editing as well. Uh, so if we scroll all the way down to the normal output, not the normal texture output, but below that, the actual normal output, uh, we can see a lot of colors that are not typically associated with normal maps. There's some bright greens and some yellows. This is because when you bake normal, it's baking normal map information, bump information, and height information. And in order to get the, a really good normal map, you don't really want all of that height and displacement. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the displacement scale just so that we have a tiny bit of hills, a little bit of that geometry is still existing. And once we do that, you'll see those colors that are more consistent with an actual normal map. And again, this is because there's very little displacement happening. But I think that this will bake really nicely into a normal map. Uh, so if we go back to the shader output, because this is how you bake normal maps directly from the shader, we can see that now our color map's affected, but that's okay because we've already baked it. Now just select that texture that you're baking to and switch from combined to normal and then click bake. Okay, so now we have a really good normal map. We can see where our puddles are and where all of the height information and bump detail is. So let's save this with the other textures. And before using it, make sure that you set the uh, color type to non-color. And now these textures are ready to be used in the Eevee render engine. So we can still use this material shader uh, for our material, but we don't need anything connected to it. We do need to remove the ambient occlusion since we've already baked it. Now let's go from the Cycles render engine to Eevee. And we're ready to add our height map with a displacement modifier. So let's click on our modifiers tab, add a modifier, and choose displace. Now I'll click the new tab and switch the coordinates to UV. And now I'll open the texture. So you should be able to find it right in the textures that are stored in Blender. And if I go back to the displace modifier, I can set the mid-level down so that the landscape sits on the grid floor. And then I'll take the strength up because it looks a bit low at the moment. Okay, that looks much better, much like it did in Cycles. Okay, now we're ready to delete our old material and add our new textures. And one last thing you might want to do is after you apply those modifiers, in edit mode you can use face select to select this little wall of geometry that forms on the outside. Uh, this is just something that Blender does whenever using a displacement map. And there you have it. Now we have our landscape in Eevee. And as basic as this tutorial was, we only covered the general features of the landscape node. We got a pretty good result without very much effort. I mean, this was a pretty easy landscape to create. Um, one thing I will do is I'll select the lamp and turn it into a sun lamp and take the strength down to about an eight and then give it some better rotation. Okay, that looks pretty good. Maybe change the color, but a little bit of a warmer color.
And in future tutorials, again, we're going to be going over other things like baking particle distribution maps so we can add things like grass and trees and rocks and so on. Let me know in the comments below what kinds of environments you guys would like to see tutorials for. Um, even maybe the potential for like a, a game environment, I think might be a really fun video to make. One last thing I'd like to do before ending the video is, uh, you know, there have been so many advancements in Blender that right now this is all running pretty smoothly despite having so much geometry. Uh, but in case that it's running a little bit slow for you, uh, let's turn on our wireframe so that we can see the progress and we'll use the decimate modifier. So I'll take this down to be pretty low. And because so much of that detail is coming from the normal map now, we can actually reduce the geometry pretty significantly without losing any detail. All right, so that's the end of the video. Uh, I will leave a link below where you can find Mask Tools if you haven't purchased it already. Uh, if you have, thank you so much for the support, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.